The sacred land on which we operate has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huon-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The territory was a subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Tuo Wampum says we are going to live on this land together and respect each other's sovereignty. The Dish with One Spoon is an agreement that recognizes we all live off the same resources. It is hard to eat a collective meal together off a Dish with One Spoon Hence, protocols are put in place to ensure mutual respect and accountability to each other and to the land. Ontario is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Our intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, Indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force, or otherwise a result of colonialism and imperialism. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 Calls to Action reaffirms that the treaties with Indigenous peoples must be lawfully honoured. We are all treaty peoples and are responsible for honouring and upholding these agreements. We are grateful for the opportunity to work on this territory and to share space with all of you. There's a lot of people to thank uh, for bringing this night together. First of all, a big thank you to Jamie and all the incredible, amazing staff at the 519 who generously opened their doors, helped with funding, helped with staffing, and are making sure that everyone is warmly welcomed here. So please give it up for Jamie and all the staff and volunteers of the Cloud 19. I'd like to say a big thank you to our community sponsors, Glad Day Bookshop, Showing Up for Racial Justice Toronto, Fight for 15 and Fairness, the Workers Action Centre, Maggie's Toronto, Climate Justice Toronto, Artists for Climate and Migrant Justice and Indigenous Sovereignty, No More Silence, No One is Illegal Toronto, and the Toronto New Socialists. I'd like to say a big thank you to Catherine Hernandez, who did all the poster design and social asset design. Thank you to Catherine. Thank you to... Catherine's here. Thank you to Ashley Cooper, who did postering and very cold days in January. A big thank you to the child care volunteers. If anyone is not aware, we do have child care both at the back and in room 100. So if you've got children who um, need a space, uh, you're welcome to go there. So a big thank you to Tatiana and everyone else from Surge Toronto. A big thank you to our ASL interpreters, Tala Jalali and Catherine Monroe. Thank you to them. I'd like to thank uh, all the bookstore staff from Another Story Bookshop who've been talking up the teaching, who've been answering questions, who are selling books. Thank you to Kale and Alios at the back. And a big thank you to Ariel and Lily who are live streaming the event. And so this is being Facebook, uh, live streamed on Facebook. And it's also being recorded. Just so you know, the only thing that will be on the live stream and recording are the visuals and the audio for the panelists. When we get to the Q&A, the audio for the questions will be uh, on the recording and on the live stream, but no faces. So just be aware of that. No one will see your face, but the panelists are, uh, and, and your questions will be on the audio. Uh, we have some books by the panelists. We also have some other books at the back. All the proceeds from book sales are being donated tonight to Transpire Toronto, and Monica and Chanel will speak more about that. Some housekeeping. There's. Uh, gendered and gender neutral bathrooms. If you walk through those doors at the back, you walk to your left and then to your left and you'll see them. And then I'd also like to say a big thank you to Pride Toronto. Uh, most people don't know that they are actually funding all the costs for tonight's event. They generously funded the honorariums for the speakers, the ASL interpretation and postering costs. And they also recognized given their contentious relationship with various members of the queer community to be left off the promotion, uh, but I wanted to acknowledge that they were a funding sponsor for tonight. So thank you to Pride Toronto for funding the event. And without further ado, we're going to go into the panel, which will be moderated by Kai Cheng Tom. <laughs> Kai Cheng Tom, who most of you know, is a writer, performance artist, and community healer in Toronto. Her novel, Fierce Femmes and Notorious Liars, a dangerous trans girl's confabulous memoir, was released by Metonymy Press in 2016. 
Her first poetry book, A Place Called No Homeland, and her children's picture book, From the Stars in the Sky to the Fish in the Sea, which was illustrated by Kai Yung Ching and Wai Yant Li, were both published by Arsenal Pulp Press in 2017. Her essay collection, I Hope We Choose Love, was published by Arsenal Pulp Press in 2019. Please join me in welcoming, really, this event would not have happened without Kai Chang Tom, without Gwen and the others as well, but Kai Chang and Gwen were really the driving forces behind this. So I want to say a very special thank you to the two of them and to Kai Chang for moderating. Thank you so much. So, you know, I'm looking out at this, like, you know, amazing, huge audience. I'm kind of like, oh, was I one of the driving forces? That was a bad idea. <laughs> um, but welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thanks so much to you, Anju, for all of your hosting and organizing work. Please, let's give a big round of applause. This would not have happened without you. And your, like, this incredible skill at hurting. Sometimes very difficult to hurt groups of activists and writers. We're not... We're not all the most organized people, despite being organizers. Well, I'll speak for myself. Um, so thank you very much. And thanks to you all for coming as well. So tonight is a teach-in. Raise your hand if you've been to a teach-in before. OK, that's like a fair number, and a fair number not also, which is great. Um, so why a teach-in, and what is a teach-in? Well, this uh, particular type of action comes from the tradition of community organizing and activism and is meant as a complement to direct action such as protests and other sorts of direct action. A protest is an action intended to raise voices and disrupt business as usual. A teaching is an opportunity for community members to share knowledge and educate each other about our common causes and strategies for making change. So tonight, our teaching is about the impact of transphobia and transmisogyny in public space and institutions. In particular, we are thinking about the impact of the presence of transphobic speaker Megan Murphy at the Toronto Public Library last November. Raise your hand if you heard something about that. Okay, that's considerably more. Um, so, so for those who are less familiar, um, Megan Murphy, uh, a well-known activist um, against the rights of, of trans folks to self-identify and use uh, public washrooms and public institutions of our gender identity, made a room booking at the Toronto Public Library for last November. Um, Ah, thank you. Deeply into the mic. There we go. Um, if anyone can't hear, just raise your hand and you'll be watching Ellen all the mind the Thank you so much. Um, so Gwen, among others, protested this event and the TPL leadership doubled down, insi oh. yeah. insisting that uh, Megan Murphy and other such speakers are entitled to freedom of speech, even if that speech harms trans women. So tonight's teach-in is going to follow a panel format and then open to Q&A from you all, the audience. And there are some ground rules for joining us in conversation, which are, firstly, to be respectful of each other, of our panelists, of the space. So we will not allow interrupting of panelists while they are speaking, um, and we will not stand for any kind of threatening or violent behavior. Um, towards participants or panelists. Uh, we want you to know that disagreement and dissent are allowed, but hate speech and oppressive behavior are not. Questions and critical thought are welcome, but please remember that you are responsible for your words and their impact on others. So we ask that you try to phrase things in a way that builds opportunity for solidarity rather than stoking aggression or hurt feelings. Let us assume good intention until proven otherwise. Um, and it is a colonial fallacy that all dialogue has to be debate. So if you have a disagreement with something someone says, you do not have to dominate the argument and prove them wrong. You can join with them in, in a dialogue. As panelists, we... Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. As panelists, we do not all speak for one another, and I do not speak for the panelists as moderator. We have diverse viewpoints, as I imagine you all do as well, uh, but I think we do share a belief in trans rights and liberation and in trans women's rights and liberation and the need to stand up for that cause particularly. As a moderator, it is my job to set boundaries on the conversation, so I may interrupt you for the sake of safety or for time. We do have um, an emotional support person present. Their name is Kay and they are near the back. 
wearing a red bandana and are waving currently. So if you need uh, someone to talk to or to listen to something difficult that you're experiencing or that's going on, um, please get in touch with Kay. Um, and lastly, if we can, let's choose love. So I'd like to introduce our incredible panelists. Let's give it up, please. I'm so honored, firstly, to introduce Gwen Benaway, who is sitting directly to my left. Yes, this is my left. Um, so Gwen is a trans girl of Anishinaabe and Métis descent, um, and is also a highly accomplished author, poet, and scholar, uh, the first trans woman to win the Governor General's Literary Award. And I promised Gwen I'd go through that quickly, so uh, I'm going to keep going. Is a PhD student at the University of Toronto in the Women and Gender Studies Institute. Um, sitting beside Gwen is Chanel Gallant, who is the co-founder and co-director of the Migrant Sex Workers Project, and she is on the international leadership team of the US-based Showing Up for Racial Justice, or SURGE. She has been an activist at the intersection of, of gender, sexuality, and criminalization for 20 years. Her writing has appeared in 12 books, most recently in Pleasure Activism. Your chapter is my favorite chapter in that book, Chanel. And in the forthcoming Beyond Survival, Strategies and Stories from the Transformative Justice Movement. She is a queer femme daughter of a poor single mother and can be found at chanelgallant.com. And lastly, but absolutely not leastly, we have Monica Forrester, a two-spirit trans woman of color whose pronouns are her, they, or Moni. Mo uh, Monica has been working and advocating with the trans and two-spirit and sex working communities for 30 years. 30 years. <laughs> and has helped innumerable people, that's my own addition, um, to bring awareness and inclusion and to break down stigma Monica Forrester is the founder of Trans Pride Toronto, Transitioning Together 2004. So, um, before we jump into our panelists, I'm going to talk because why not? <laughs> I'm just going to say one thing to the panelists. They're having a hard time seeing you at the back. Okay. If anyone is willing to stand as long as you just stand while you're speaking, that would be helpful. To totally. I, I can stand. Um, you can see my beautiful outfit better this way. Uh, or just see me at all better this way, I guess. So, um, just a few remarks to frame our discussion. Um, our other amazing panelists will speak to uh, the history and activism that frames uh, this event. So I'd like to stay, set the stage a little, a, bit, a little bit. What are some of the issues at hand that are bringing us together today? So, in the contemporary moment, we have a pattern of gender critical, or so-called gender critical, also known as trans-exclusionary radical feminists holding events in public spaces, especially libraries in Canada. Megan Murphy is a prominent example, but certainly not the only one. These speakers, in general, argue that the recent expansion of legal rights to trans people, and particularly trans women and trans feminine individuals, endangers cis women and children. They are particularly opposed to the legal right to self-identify one's own gender, which allows us to choose our own public washrooms, use gendered public spaces, such as shelters and rape crisis centers, and change our legal identification. Prisons are also implicated, though this is somewhat more complex given a prison abolition standpoint, which I come from. They also argue that trans activists, allies, and protective policies are a danger to the, quote, freedom of speech because we protest when they attempt to disseminate these viewpoints in public spaces, including the internet. So I think it's important to note that trans-exclusionary feminism comes from a long history stretching back to the 1970s. This history has tended to target trans women as predators in disguise, while casting trans men as dupes of the patriarchy or as sex traitors. Then, feminists such as Janice Raymond argued that trans women are actually appropriating and quote-unquote raping the female body. So it's important to understand these viewpoints to a certain extent because they impact how we, re we relate to each other in queer community. 
there is a significant rift between cis queer and trans communities today as a result of this so-called debate on trans identity. If we want to heal, I think we need to understand, but certainly not agree, with what so-called gender critical feminism is and what its projects are. I, not speaking for others, am interested in healing this rift within our community because I want to protect future generations of trans women and femmes. So regarding the argument that trans women are men who appropriate women's bodies, I want to state for the record, trans women are women. We are not pretending and therefore not predators in disguise. I want to, though, break away from the territory of having to prove that we are women, which places us perpetually in the place of defending our existence and our right to exist. Statistics show that trans women are disproportionately at risk at similar or increased levels to cis women for tr discrimination, violence, assault, and murder, and those statistics are multiplied when we consider the number of trans women working in vulnerable sex work situations. It is true that our experience is not the same as cis women's, which I think is probably more boring. Similarly, <laughs> racialized women have a different experience from white women's and disabled women from abled women's experience. The fault line that supposedly makes trans women's experience invalid is arbitrary. It is meant to erase and to kill us. Regarding freedom of speech, freedom of speech means many things to many people. In law, however, it is the right to not be imprisoned or to experience bodily harm for one's opinions. And in fact, we do not have freedom of speech in Canada as such. We have freedom of expression, which comes with limits and responsibilities. But beyond colonial law, always a dubious construct, we as human beings have a duty and responsibility to speak with integrity and respect for the ancient law of human decency. Speech intended, up, intended to stir up fear of a small population and restrict our freedoms, the freedom to have a body in public is harmful. If you are free to make such speech, if you have the agency and adult presence of mind to do so, you are also responsible for its impact and responsible for facing the responses of others. I stated earlier that I have engaged with trans-exclusionary feminism because I want to understand where it comes from, to protect others from it and to heal the wounds it causes. Let's be clear, trans-exclusionary feminism is a scarcity politic born of fear and the desire for supremacy, the fear that there is not enough room for everyone to be free. TERFs believe that trans women's freedom endangers their safety. Their mistake is that supremacy and safety are not the same thing. Their choice would be to restrict our freedom and our lives in the name of their comfort. What and who does that remind you of? It comes down to what we believe about the nature of human relationships, what we believe about liberty. I want to choose courage over fear and love over violence. I want to believe that there is room for all women to be free. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from the incredible Gwen Benoit. This is trans misogyny. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, great. I just have to deep throat it. I can do that. <laughs> I'll be fine. Um, hi, I'm Gwen. It's nice to be here tonight. I'm sorry for the halo of staples on my head. I had um, facial feminization surgery last Thursday, so it's seven days ago. So that's why I look like a transsexual Frankenstein. Okay. Again, that was trans misogyny. <laughs> I made several funny jokes, and now I don't know who heard them, so I can't repeat them. And you know, that's that's mostly what I was sitting there doing. So I lost my bits. Um, more ways than one. That is not fair. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, yeah, I'm going and I'm going to focus my comments um, mostly around the Toronto Public Library and the protests that, that happened there. Um, I'm mostly known for cyberbullying Vicky Bowles on Twitter. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try to choose love more. <laughs> I have a problem with tweeting. <laughs> 
I think she's okay. I think she's okay. I'm like, you know what? Go to the spa. You'll be all right. <laughs> Mute me. It's fine. It was really funny. Someone tweeted at me yesterday. It was a turf. Um, was like, you're cyberbullying Vickery Bulls. You're cyberbullying a middle-aged woman. And I was like, oh, you just cyberbullied her. Don't call her middle-aged. It was really funny. Everyone's been calling her a middle-aged woman everywhere. John Kay was like, middle-aged woman. They're being mean to a middle-aged woman. I was like, you're being mean, John Kay. Stop that. We don't know how she identifies. <laughs> Age is just a number. Um, I think for me that the key point that I want to focus on is our response to the Toronto Public Library booking uh, the event with Megan Murphy organized by Rad Femmes Unite. Um, our response was to initially try to seek dialogue. And so we sought dialogue with the Toronto Public Library. They did not engage or reciprocate that dialogue. We went to a board meeting, a large collective of us, a number of queer and trans organizations and then community members and as well as many writers from the Toronto community. And we spoke to them and, and said, these are our concerns, these are our fears, this is our expertise that we're bringing to, to talk to you about this decision. Um, you know, was there consultation? Who did you engage with? What's the intention here? And the Toronto Public Library Board did not listen to us. They did not engage with anything we said in that meeting. Um, they sat there in silence. And of course, uh, just this week, we FOI results were released. We know that the Toronto Public Library made their decision to book uh, Radfem and Megan Murphy back in July of this year. And that decision had already been made without any engagement or consultation with LGBTQS folks in Toronto. Even, it seems, without a substantive engagement with their own policies around rental use. Um, and in that, we see that they strategically decided to control information about the event happening, that they thought it was in the library's interest to not engage us uh, and to see if we had any reaction when the Rad Femme group started promoting the event on Facebook. In fact, they asked the Rad Friend group not to promote their event too early, to delay the promotion of their event, because they didn't want to give the queer and trans community in Toronto time to organize and mobilize. And so my, my frustration with that situation is when it reached the moment of uh, this community who showed up, so many allies and queer and trans folk in Toronto who showed up to the Palmerston branch and we were a peaceful, joyful, radiant uh, group of people there that night. Um, when we reached the moment of protest, we had already sort of lost in a sense because from that moment on, the conversation has framed us as censoring, as being opposed to free speech, as threatening, as Heather Mellick, the Toronto Star um, journalist said, as a group of men threatening women, threatening feminists. Um, and Megan Murphy really had won the day uh, because it allowed her to control the narrative. And we saw that with op-ed editorials across national media in Canada saying, here's a bunch of, of militant trans folks shutting down conversation. Um, but we tried to have that conversation and the Toronto Public Library did not make space for that. And I've continued to not make space for that conversation. Are there any members of the Toronto Public Library Board here tonight? Okay, we invited them. We did, we invited them. And they would have been safe in this space. We're pretty nice. I mean, when I'm not on Twitter, I'm really sweet. <laughs> on Twitter, you know, I'm, yeah. you know, it depends what time of day it is. Um, and their continuation of not engaging with this community, of not prioritizing our experiences or our expertise, of listening to actual feminists, of listening to queer and trans folks, I think is a serious issue. And that's an issue with the leadership at the Toronto Public Library, and it's an issue in libraries and public institutions across Canada. Um, protecting the quote unquote freedom of expression right over our protected charter rights as trans individuals around our sex based rights and our gender based rights, that is an issue. And I'm hoping that people will see through this teaching that we're here for dialogue, we're here for conversation, um, we are not, I mean, I am, but these other people are lovely. <laughs> They're really nice. They're really nice. Um, and I have moments, I have moments, I'm just really bitter, you know? But I think when I have enough plastic surgery, I'll just become a better person. This is my goal. 
and I'm up to $60,000 worth. So, you know, we'll see what else. I'm going to get some fillers. I've heard that that makes you a better person. I think if I'm plumper, like the plumper I'll get, the nicer I'll be. Um, <laughs> this is my intention. Yeah. Laugh with me. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to laugh. You guys can laugh. Um, so I think that's really what the focus of my comments wanted to be, just on the complete failure of the uh, Toronto Public Library to respect us, to respect the queer and trans community in Toronto, and a missed opportunity, um, a missed opportunity to have really important dialogue. Um, I think the people who don't want dialogue are the Toronto Public Library. They're the ones that are suppressing speech, um, and Rad Femmes and Megan Murphy. Um, they're the ones that are actually interested in not having this dialogue. Um, and that's a very politically opportunistic um, movement for them. Um, I think that's really the focus I have. I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say. Thank you all so much for coming. Again, the queer and trans community in Toronto continues to be a beautiful, powerful, radiant group of people. And I'm really proud to work with you on this. I'm an old lady. Hi, everyone. I'm Monica. Yeah, I have a migraine. It's the weather and stuff. So thank you for having me here today. I think a lot of people know me. I've been around forever and ever and ever. And they know me as many things, the media horror, the big old sex worker that terrorizes people. And, but, um, but what I'm going to talk about, because I, you know, um, they want me to talk about the impacts of exclusion, feminism, and marginalized, on marginalized trans, does this work? Hello? Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, on a trans women and uh, women's services, and also the relationship between TERF and SWERFs, and how that impacts trans people. So as you know, I, at a young age, I came out into this community at 17, 18, um, and trans people were around. They were everywhere, but they weren't being recognized. And we still we were getting better in the community. It's really hot right here. We're getting better in the community, and um, but um, for someone that grew up thinking that queer people were loving people and happy people and loved everyone, that it was a different situation when I came in the community when I met trans people and just how people talked. Especially people in our community talked about trans people, those people. They were violent, they were sex workers, they were dirty. You know, and, and it just really, really struck with me that, you know, um, trans people were living in the shadows of our community for many decades. Even before I was around, trans people were around. Trans women, more, I'm talking more on trans women, but they were part of the feminist movement. Most often they're the most possible, but they were part of that movement. And they were, we've always been a part of the feminist movement, you know what I mean, in different capacities. So, you know, um, for like myself, I've always been a feminist, but I'm also a trans feminist, you know what I mean? And I'm writing a book on trans feminism in my way, because, you know, we have to recognize, if we look at feminism and, and the many, uh, the many, um, well, the many um, waves of feminism, women were excluded through those those waves, right? And so we're just the next wave. Well, actually, this wave's getting better, I will say. The feminists now, they're great. Like, most of them, they're fabulous. <laughs> but, you know, but it's just ironic. We've had women that have been oppressed through the waves of feminism are now oppressing other women. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, but it's been ironically like that through the wave of feminism. So when I, you know, when I see my friends dying prematurely, uh, you know, dying from just basic health care, the basic going to a drop in, and I go to a drop in and say, oh, you just go over there in that corner. You know, staff would look at us and, what are we going to do with those people? Or we go to a more faith based place and they were trying to convert us. And, you know what I mean? Like, 
or no, you got to go to a men's shelter, and we were sexualized and beat up, you know. And so we chose to live on the streets, you know. And we, you know, we couldn't get jobs. No one wanted to hire us. We were freaks, you know. Uh, so sex work was the work that we did. But in that community, it kept me alive. That community kept a lot of people alive. You know, I'm so grateful to live 50 years because all my friends, when I was 18, were dying at 20 and 18 and 21. And I, I really thought I would be one of those statistics. And I'm so grateful I wasn't. And I'm so grateful for the many people, my friends that have passed on, that's given me so much to get out there, to stand strong and positive and to break down some of these barriers. And I credit Mir Soleil, a well-known activist in Montreal that's really had started, at, um, what was that called, trash? Um, gender trash. You know, she was out there. She was engaging with communities. She was putting publications together, you know what I mean, in her home. You know what I mean? She was having little sit-ins with trans people and saying, what do we need? She was on the forefront. And I took that from her and said, I need to make change. 519 gave me an opportunity in 1999 to be the first ever sex worker, outreach worker of Toronto. And it was, I was so happy. I was so happy to, I was so happy with the 519, first of all, Mir Soleil to hire me. But I was so happy that, I, you know, community was actually going to be recognized, that we were going to have a space that we were going to be able to sit together and talk and feel safe in a space without people telling us we had to look a certain way or you weren't accepted, you know, and that program just grew. And then after that, we, we did the Trans Prime 101 with a bunch of other people like Alex Butler and um, so many other people, Mir Soleil, and I could go brain fog, but there's, I want to credit everyone. And then we went to Trans Access, me and uh, Tina Strang. We actually were the ones that actually started opening up shelters. We went into those shelters. We went to over 100 shelters. The city paid us to go. And you know how, how rough that was for me to listen to some of the transphobic stuff that staff was saying about trans people and why they weren't acceptable. And I was just taken back. Some of these VAW agencies, as people know them as violence against women agencies, uh, were the things they were saying, it was just so hurtful, considering, you know what I mean, had no compassion around trans women and violence, sexual violence, and you know, um, and uh, so we went through it, we, we actually got, the, you know, uh, uh, policies changed, and you know, yes, we had trans people, women going into and non-binary people going into spaces they self-identify as. But are these spaces really safe? You know, I really question those things. You know, I left the 519 because I didn't, as much as I love my community, but I wanted to go mainstream. And for the last 20 years, I've been working in agencies that don't have trans people. I'm the first ever trans person in their agency. You know, and I've, I've you know, experienced transphobia from staff, from, I'm working down at Sherbin and Dundas at a part-time place where it's one of the roughest places in the city. You know what I mean? And I put a smile on my face. And you know what? I've changed people's attitudes about trans people. You know what I mean? Um, but what I'm saying, it's like these organizations, oh, sorry, these, I know. I thought I was loud. Okay, these organizations, you know, they're, most of them are only allowing trans women in because they have to, because it's part of their funding, because they will have their funding revoked if they don't. I go into those places, and the things that I see are the targeting of women targeting trans women and nothing being done. And why? Because staff are reinforcing these things. Staff are dismissing them or not acknowledging them. Most uh, trans uh, women, you know, uh, are being cherry-picked or privileged by the way they look. You know, oh, she's possible, sure, experience are valid. You know what I mean? These are the commonalities that we see all the time, well, that I see all the time in a lot of these spaces. Um, so now I'm going to go back to watch my notes, whatever they were. <laughs> uh, um, 
you know, so, um, but we got to understand, oh, hold on, I'm getting over here, sorry, that there's still a lot of work to do. You know, we still, as a community, people that are working in spaces need to be hiring trans people. We need to be stepping up and talk and, and just, you know, when people are being transphobic, it's up to us as a community to be, you know, defending trans people and saying it's not a right. It's not a right. You need to be working on policies wherever you work, whatever, whatever school you go to, and making sure they're inclusive to trans and non-binary people and make sure those policies are not about how a person looks or how a person acts. You know, these policies should be the same across the board for anyone that is accessing those spaces. Um, and thanks to Alec Butler that worked really hard to make those changes in a lot of those, those places. Um, so here we go. I know. So most, like I said, most feminists working in VAW service feel that trans women are women due to their biological genitals at birth and determines their violence. So, you know, I think, you know, it, oh, sorry. They, they reinforce that our genitals is who we are. You know, I go into places and like, oh, because she may have a penis that that woman's going to be triggered. But how does that woman know what's between her legs? Like, you know what I mean? Unless you're telling her that. You know what I mean? So we, we have to, we, you know, we have to, you know, and I, so a lot of these things, because it's so ironic when I go into these trainings, the things that they ask, it's like, oh, well, we want them to dress really feminine and we want them to have, they have to shave and they have to have long hair and they got to have their breasts in and, you know, because we're dealing with a more marginalized group that don't, you know, that don't have the financial means to have surgeries. And in this day and age, I'm so glad that, you know, not all trans people should have surgeries to be accepted. You know what I mean? I came out in an era where, because I was queer, bi, and I was looked down upon. I'm so happy today that trans people can be any sexuality, can be identified able any way they like, that we can look any way we want and be accepted within our communities. You know, so there has been a lot of change, but these are some of the same stuff that's still going on in these agencies. You know, um, so, you know, once again, um, also I worked with uh, uh, one of the community colleges because I took one of their women's studies I was the first ever trans woman in my class. And believe me, the things that I heard were just shocking. Even especially because I'm not only trans, I'm a sex worker. You know, so it was really appalling that we, in this movement, we talk about our body, our choice. This is like the big thing, our body, our choice. But when they talk about sex work, they, it's like, you know, that they're taking away our choice. They're taking away our choice and what we want to do with our body. They're saying, no, it's not okay for someone to pay us or touch our bodies, especially a male form of that, right? So it's just, I had to argue all these things in class. And you know, to this day, I can honestly say, they are sticking up for sex workers' rights. And I'm so happy about that because I made, I really was upset that they would throw sex workers and women under the bus. You know what I mean? Sex work is a job. It's like any job, you know what I mean? It's, a, it's you know, the only thing that, you know, the only thing, the only thing, the, sex work is a job, but, you know, the only thing is that, you know, what we need is to decriminalize it. We need to decriminalize sex work. <laughs> sex work, sex work allows the turfs and the swerve to dictate how sex work workers are treated. They, as that, the, the, the way they dictate sex work, and that, it, it pushes violence among sex workers. It allows predators to violently hurt us. It allows uh, our justice system, our, you know, people that are supposed to protect us to say it's our fault. You know what I mean? So the turfs, you know, and the spurfs are, you know, are, are, 
actually enabling all women in our community. You know, because when you think about it, you know, when I went to the Me Too movement a couple of years, I was the first one, first sex worker group there, and I, I really, you know, I felt really awkward being there, but it, it was a chance to really talk about you know what I mean? Women in in the sex industry and and the violence they experience, but not only the violence they might may experience through the work, but the violence they're experiencing within places they access, within protection that's supposed to 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 support them, within the justice system that's supposed to fight for them. You know what I mean? So and we all know, you know what I mean, that these we've already we're dealing it with already with women around the way they dress when we look a certain way, you know what I mean? But it's always the sex workers that are the ones that are, that are, um, what's that word? Um, enforcing this violence among all women and so forth. So I know I, I kind of went all over the block. Uh, so I've had this headache all day. But, <laughs> but I just want to say we're not that this new internet kind of experience explosion of trans people, you know what I mean? We're not, uh, terms of words want people to think that, you know, that we were just this new 20th century kind of uh, make-believe people that were just kind of created through surgery to, you know what I mean, to, and now we want rights and all this stuff. Trans, trans people, non-binary people, have always been around. They've always been in every part of our communities. You know, they, they, they're, they're everyone's family or friend or mother or father. You know, um, and I will say in 1996, 97, you know, yes, the when the internet started, yes, trans people were sexualized. You know, they were called she males, the taboo fantasy. But you know what? When I started working, uh, I was considered that exotic when I worked for an escort agency. You know what I mean? So for, for a lot of people that are in the sex industry, that was good business for them. That was like, wow, you know what I mean? So, and that was something I also wanted to argue because we also, with, even within the community, we're, there's this about self-identity. Self that, you know, is something that I have a problem with because, you know what, I change my identity wherever I go. And that's for safety. So through my work, yeah, I'm a she-male. I'm a lady boy or whatever I want to call myself. But when I enter a certain space, I might be just a woman. Or when I have to go to a space that's for trans women, I'm a trans woman. Two more minutes? Okay, thank you. <laughs> but, um, what I'm saying is, you know, we all have to come together. You know what I mean? We all have different identities and we need to respect those identities. Even though, yes, some of those identities are derogatory, you know what I mean, to some people, but they're not to others. And we have to respect that. If someone is, if I'm owning that I'm a she man, then that's my identity. I'm not saying that's your identity, but that's my identity and we need to respect that. Um, but just, I just want to say thank you for having me here. I, like I said, I do a lot of my work. Trans Pride Toronto was, came out of being kind of stigmatized, you know, but then some of the work that I was doing. Uh, cause sometimes, you know, I would like to see more visibility for trans women in spaces and, in more privileged roles, bigger roles, running programs. You know, I would like to see uh, trans people having full-time jobs instead of precarious jobs. Um, I would like them to be a part of planning things and have a voice. You know, uh, through a lot of the work that I've done, I've experienced a lot of stigma. I've been silenced. I've been fired for opening my mouth too much. Um, you know, so um, I would like to see those change. I want to see those changes. and. You know, I sacrificed a lot of my life to be out as a sex worker, to be who I am. And um, when I first started doing a lot of this work, I thought, was well, that the best thing that I should have did? And, you know, um, because I now understand why I 
question that piece. But I don't regret it. I don't regret it because once one door closes, there's always a door that opens. You know, and so Transpire Toronto, we've been around, we were the first ever in 2004 to walk in the annual Gay Pride Parade that Pride Toronto actually funded. We were a walking contingency, but we were out there because I was tired of trans people standing on the sidelines and people looking at us but not appreciating us, not validating us. And uh, it was so empowering for the women that I worked with and lived with that we walked down Young Street with that banner. And that's all we had. And we had our glory. And we were so happy just to be a part of that and say, we are here. You know what I mean? And we are here. And it is so great that I can walk out my door. Sorry. And I can go pretty well anywhere and see someone that, that's part of my community that I can identify with. It's so great that trans people are making strides. And I know sometimes it's unsafe. It's unsafe, but I know that, you know, our community is very strong. And I've met and I'm still meeting so many trailblazers that are changing so much. And I just want to say to you, keep it up. You know, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. everyone. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Hooray! Are we ready to talk about the history of uh, radical feminism? Um, so my name is Chanel and uh, I am, uh, I've been an organizer for about 20 years and for the past 15 I have organized with sex workers. I am a proud former sex worker myself and <clears throat> um, Tonight I want to talk a little bit about the history of sex work exclusive radical feminism and trans exclusive radical feminism and how I understand their relationship. Um, we sometimes call them swerf and turfs, uh, but I'm going to call them rad femmes because that's also how they refer to themselves, which is a shame because I am a radical feminist, but that language has been co-opted. So <clears throat> I want to talk specifically about the rad femme attack on... Um, women and femmes specifically. So I'm going to focus specifically on, on women sex workers and trans women and femmes. Um, and basically I want to make a couple central points. The first one is that the fight over transphobia and horophobia in feminism is not a dispute within feminism. It's not a diversity or inclusion issue. It's not a free speech issue. But it's actually part of a very long history of supremacy and domination within feminism that dates back to its founding. So this is an issue of power, not diversity. So the second point I want to make is that the solutions to this problem are not about including all sides. The solutions are actually radical. They're about breaking the power of bigots, <clears throat> even when they are feminists, and giving that power to trans women and sex workers. Who needs all sides when you could just have justice? Okay, so we've heard a lot tonight about how uh, some feminists fear and loathe trans women and femmes, and those people typically always hate sex workers too. Women sex workers, they don't care about the men. Um, they work to keep sex work illegal, even though criminalization has been shown to triple violence against sex workers. Um, and they consider sex workers to essentially be an inferior and polluted kind of woman. But this isn't new. So it looks like Swerf and Turf feminism just appeared, you know, in the late 70s with the publication by Janice Raymond of the Transsexual Empire. Uh, but in fact, um, the first wave of white feminists, those suffragettes, they were bigoted elite white women who advocated for, quote, selective breeding of human beings to improve the race. They fought for forced sterilization to keep the vote out of the hands of indigenous and black people, to keep immigrants and Jews out of the country. 
You know, the first woman mayor of a major Canadian city actually traveled coast to coast on a speaking tour to convince Canadians that they should deny entry to Jewish orphans during World War II. She was successful. They were denied entry. This has a real cost. Okay, but there's a deeper point I wanna make here. The point I wanna make is that feminist bigots don't use feminism just to exclude. The exclusion itself is not the point. They use bigotry to advance their own access to power. That's the point. It's actually not about us. They don't really care about us. They don't want women's liberation. They want the same power as elite white men because they themselves are very often privileged women. And this is rarely addressed, that all the major figures in Swerf and Turf feminism are well-educated, uh, white women, white cis women. And they get access to comfy jobs. They get to write policy, write the laws, get professorships, get book deals, become mayors, get funding for their anti-trafficking organization, have movies made about their bravery for freeing the slaves, which is how they refer to sex workers. What bigoted feminists do to trans women and sex workers is what they have been doing to poor women and women of color for centuries which is to present a highly marginalized group of women as too dangerous or damaged to be fit for power. <laughs> so that's why trans women are painted as predators and sex workers as victims, because we don't generally see victims and predators as fit for power. Um, and yet this domination is presented as simply part of the diversity of opinions in feminism, right? And here, I'm just gonna use a case study of Megan Murphy as a kind of example of how this pans out in real life. So back in 2011, I was working for a sex workers organization here in the city called Maggie's. And at the time, Megan Murphy began writing for Rabble, which is a feminist left online magazine. And in her first piece, Megan writes about how sex work activists are dangerous to women like her because they're individualistic and they're manipulative and they're selfish neoliberals. And just a reminder that um, neoliberal refers to the wealthy elite. And a bunch of us write letters to Rabble asking that they let sex workers write about sex work. That's all. It's, it's just a request to share the platform. And they refuse, explaining that this is just a difference of opinion in feminism and that sex workers don't understand feminist opinions on sex work. Wow, that was news to us. So then in 2013, a group of rad femmes announced they want to hold a conference here in Toronto against sex work decriminalization because the Bedford decision had just happened and they were going to include Megan Murphy as a speaker. So of course they planned to exclude trans women. And in response, I organized successfully to get their venue pulled in 24 hours. None of this Toronto Public Library bullshit. Their venue was revoked, and then we organized a few counter events. One was here in this space, um, and one of them was a crafting and storytelling afternoon in a park where two-spirit trans women and sex workers shared what feminism meant to them. We made a big banner. It was cute. The rad fams called in fake death threats and rape threats and they describe themselves as subject to, quote, terrorism. So the police investigated our event twice. Sending cops to a space that is entirely sex workers, trans women, and two-spirit people is a rape and death threat. But the media ignored it, including the left media. One left outlet described both sides as, quote, paranoid. So by 2015, Rabble has now published Megan Murphy calling sex workers. I'm gonna list some of the things she has described sex workers as. It's very intense. Um, holes, orifices, receptacles, slaves, prostituted women, and teenage pussy. All in a leftist magazine, and it is all still up there today. Why? because these opinions were misunderstood as representing a diversity of a feminist opinion. 
not a power grab by university-educated white women making careers for themselves. We wrote angry letters. Angro pro Rabble promoted her. Later, I found out that Rabble was founded by Judy Rebick, one of Canada's most famous feminists. Well, not many people know that Judy Rebick, back in the day, testified on behalf of Vancouver Rape Relief in their court case to exclude trans women from their services, their successful court case. No one has ever held Judy accountable for that. She has never spoken on that decision or made amends to trans women who are cut off from access to crisis services after a rape. So on Rabble, they continue to publish Megan Murphy. She starts writing about black, black trans women like Laverne Cox and Janet Mock, suggesting that their womanhood is a joke and dangerous to cis women. We start a petition. It's signed by dozens of social justice organizations. Rabble doubles down. They publish two statements in her defense stating, quote, Megan Murphy is not racist or transphobic. She eventually leaves Rabble and writes a blog post about how she sympathizes with the right and specifically praises an editor at Breibart News. Yeah, do you see where this is going? She then goes to the House of Commons to defend denying basic human rights and protections to trans people. Now fast forward to 2019 and more rad femmes are openly aligning with the far right. The White Supremacist Heritage Foundation in the UK invites a turf to speak. Megan Murphy goes on Fox News with white supremacist Tucker Carlson, one of the most racist public figures in American TV, to talk about how trans people are an invention of the academic elite. Today, swerfs and turfs are using right-wing populism. They build a warm relationship with male-dominant institutions like the police and right-wing media and claim that they are the victims of a far less privileged group of people. They punch down. But the concerns of trans women and sex workers are seen as paranoia. We have to fight this idea that rad femmes represent a difference of opinion that deserve inclusion and treat this bigotry as a tactic by the powerful to get consent to their own domination. The solution is not about hearing all sides. It's not about a debate. I don't debate with Nazis and I don't debate with TERFs. The solution... <laughs> the solution is about breaking their power. The solution is about moving that power to the people who are most directly impacted, which is sex-working trans women of color. Um, I'm gonna call it there. <laughs> Wow. Thank you so much. They you really need to like, it needs to be like touching my lips, basically. Um, we're all getting so in intimate. <laughs> a fair point. Um, <laughs> let's give a big round of applause for all of our incredible panelists. I feel so honored and so joyful to be sitting beside such incredible activists, organizers, people. So we're going to open to audience. Oh, oh right. Thank you. Pardon? Yes. Um, before we open to audience uh, comments and questions, uh, I believe that Sh um, Chanel and Monica have a way for folks in the audience to concretely support trans folks beyond this event. So hey everyone, so I was telling you about Trans Pride Toronto and we have been working, we're more of a satellite office, um, but we're still, you know, we, we do a lot of work, uh, you know, uh, getting out there, we have a wonderful board of diverse uh, community members that are, you know, people from the Two-Spirit community, the Black African Caribbean community, uh, people from all over. And so right now, we actually just got a space. We finally, you know, after uh, Julie that was murdered uh, in December, a good friend of mine, 
and an activist in our community, uh, we decided we need more spaces for trans people. We need to actually get on the ball, get a trans-only agency that really specifically works on the, on the issues and the lives that trans and non-binary people have services that they can access daily, have a drop-in that they can feel safe and come to, you know, not 24 hours, we're hoping that one day, but a space where they feel comfortable, feel like they can stay when they want to, and have people that can work with them around violence, around housing, around um, finding them supports, or just a place where they can have fun. So uh, we're currently going to be moving into Trinity, the Trinity Church. They have a, a brick house on the side, so we're we're renting an office, and we got access to uh, three drop, three open spaces, which is great. Uh, so we will be running um, a, a weekend program, which we feel that's something that the city lacks, and there's not a lot of spaces for trans people to access uh, on the weekends. And so we are asking for donations because we don't have any money. Uh, we've had a few grants in the past, but because I work in so many other different places, I haven't been really focused, but I've met a, a bunch of great people that see the vision, that are going to work with the work with Transpire Toronto to apply for funding, but we're just hoping that people can maybe, you know, um, donate five, ten, or whatever you want. This will help for us to make that that drop in on the week, the weekend successful, enjoyable, that we can have food and tokens, uh, you know, we can uh, make sure that um, we can get someone in the community to do outreach, to promote the services that we have, and so forth, and I'll give it to them. Uh, hey everyone, who here believes in trans leadership? <laughs> I don't know. Do you really believe in trans leadership? Let's try that again. Who here believes in trans leadership? Yeah. I like it. Who believes that trans people are the solution to transphobia? Yeah. Who here believes in trans women of color leadership? Yeah. Who here believes in sex working trans? leadership <laughs> now what we want to offer people the chance to do today is sometimes you know we know that things aren't right we want to make a difference but we don't know how and really for me what I understand allyship to be the reason I'm standing up here is because allyship for me means directly supporting the leadership of trans women of color and that can look like a lot of different ways one way it looks, though, is material. I grew up poor. I don't think money is incidental. I don't think it's an afterthought. It matters. Money matters. Money keeps women alive. And so what we're going to offer to people the chance to do today is to donate to Trans Pride Toronto. Now, do you know that in this city there is not a single service for trans people that is within an agency that is trans run? Not one. How big is Toronto? Big. <laughs> Can you believe there's not a single service here run by a trans person? So all trans programming in the city is within an agency that are run by cis people. No disrespect to cis people. I'm a cis person. That's great. Also, trans programming should be run by trans people, right? And so what Monica's doing is a continuation of what she's been doing since she was an 18-year-old on the corner, keeping trans women alive. That's what that looked like. That's what trans services were. She was part of a crew that started the first trans programming in Canada, which was Meal Trans, here at the 519. And I love trans people. I'm partnered to trans people. And I just want to thank you and all the trans women of color elders who have done so much to make their lives possible. Okay, so who wants to give? I'm going to start. Yes, hands are up. Okay, great. You're going to get your chance. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a thing where I'm going to put out a number, 
And I'm going to invite you to put your hands up if you want to give at that level. And we're going to clap for those people. And we're going to go all the way down to 5 or $10. But because we respect poor people, we're going to clap for the ones giving 5 and $10 too, right? Everybody with me? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So some people are uncomfortable with this. They're like, oh my God, we're going to talk about money openly. Yeah, you bet we are. <laughs> you bet we are. Hi, socialist feminist at the front of the room. Um, so the first thing I'm going to ask is, is there anyone in this room who feels ready to make a contribution to TransPride Toronto? Oh, of a thousand dollars. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Now there are people in the room. Can you show Tatiana? Where are you with the? Tatiana is in the corner back there. Please wait. Keep waving, Tatiana. Tatiana is a volunteer from Surge Toronto, a dear comrade, and she's going to be able to take credit cards and bank cards. Okay? Yeah, we don't play. Yeah, we, we're getting your money tonight. Um, is Carl here? We're just going to get a Gmail address on the screen. Just press the button here. I tried. Oh, it didn't work? Oh, I, pressed the wrong I pressed the wrong thing. Okay, while they work out the tech, so thank you so much for kicking us off with a contribution of $1,000. I'm going to ask if anyone in the room is ready to give at the level of $750. This is where we sit in silence, and it's okay because people need a minute to think about whether they can give that amount. That's fine. Okay, is anyone in this room ready to give at the level of 500 to Transpride Toronto? We have one, two, three. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Carly, can you be counting? Thank you. On it. Uh, so we're already at $2,500. Now, who in this room is ready to give at the level of 250? Yes, thank you. Keep your hands up, please. Can you raise them a little bit higher? Okay. Now, I'd love to see a lot of hands go up when I ask, who in this room is ready to give at 100? Yay! That's $1,000 easily right there. Thank you. Okay. And who is ready to give $50 to Transpride to Tons more! Fantastic, thank you. Keep your hands up, please, because Carly is counting. Great. Okay. And who among you is ready to give $25 to Transpride Toronto tonight? Yes, thank you. A hand. We clap for $25. Great. And I want to remind people of why these small dollar donations, smaller dollar donations are important. Often they're coming from people who have lower income and are actually giving a larger portion of their income. They're giving, you know, and that's often the way it is with fundraising. Poor and working class people give larger amounts. Okay, who can give $10 tonight to TransPride Toronto? Yes! Yes, thank you! Woo! Yes! Thank you so much, folks. What we're going to ask you to do when we're done is you're going to speak to Tatiana, who is going to take your uh, credit cards, or you're going to do an e-transfer. You're just getting it up there. Okay. Yeah. So we'll put the e-transfer up, and then if you want to do it on your phone right now, that would be great, because we didn't take your email addresses. Normally, we would follow up, but we're going to count on you to follow through. Does everyone feel committed to doing that? Yes. Yes? Okay. Okay. Yes, and we can also take cash, so of course. Uh, you can hand them to Carly in the sweater over there. So Carly in the sweater. Carly in the sweater is the cash donations. Cards to Tatiana and e-transfers are going to be up here. Thank you everyone who just materially supported the Trans Pride Toronto and Trans Women of Color Sex Worker Leadership. about six thousand dollars and there's where you can send your e-transfers right now if y'all get on your phones I won't be offended <laughs> yeah. so uh, thank you so much Monica and Chanel let's give them one more round of applause for all of the work 
and dedication and allyship. I have to say I feel so full of hope and energy and joy just seeing this room commit in such an amazing concrete way to supporting trans women of color, sex worker, leadership and change in this city. Don't you feel full of hope and joy? And you're like, yes, I could give away a ton of money, so helpful. But it is, it really means, it means a ton. Sorry, so, I'm, just, I'm just gonna make one quick comment. Uh, people have been asking on the Facebook live stream. We want to say the e-transfer for everyone who's listening on Facebook or for the recording. Please send your e-transfers to transpridetorontott at gmail.com T-R-A-N-S-P-R-I-D-E T-O-R-O-N-T-O-T-T at gmail.com. Sorry to interrupt, but I want to make sure we can get as much money in. Uh, we'll put it in the Facebook event, but for the live stream. Yeah. And maybe we can make, um, yeah, like posts following the events as well. We want everyone who wants to, uh, to be able to have a chance to support. So we are going to move into the Q&A uh, section of the event. Uh, Andrew, I'm c counting on you to help me keep time. Yeah. And um, so I think what we'll do um, is if folks don't feel comfortable uh, asking a question or making a comment out loud, um, you can write it down and pass it to um, Anju here at the front. Or keep it at the book table. Or keep it at the book table, pass it to the book table, and that question will make its way in written format to us here. There is uh, paper and pens at the book table as well. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. So let's um, open it up. And I think we only have the one working mic, so we might have to pass it back and forth. So uh, for those making donations, uh, please make the password to e-transfers Toronto. Okay. All lowercase for simplicity. So are there folks? And for checks. And for checks. If you need to pay by check, please come up after the event to talk to Monica and Chanel. So, opening to questions and comments from the audience. Anju, there's someone with a... only live one and it's attached. Hello, is this mic working? Can you hear from here? Okay. So I want to offer a resource. I had the great privilege uh, recently of working with Monica Forster. My name's Audrey and I'm with No More Silence. Um, so we, well, Monica and I made a film called Smudge Don't Judge, assisting trans two-spirit survivors of violence. And if you need, you know, that talks to people and gives them concrete things of what not to do, so you don't compound the trauma of people who've already experienced a lot of violence, direct them to this film. Just Google it, it's on YouTube. We also have a whole page um, on the It Starts With Us, uh, MMIW website, which is No More Silence's website, where you can see the full length interviews with Monica, with Alex Wilson, with Teddy Surratt, and with a whole bunch of community members who participated in this amazing project. I learned so much in the year that we spent working together on this, and I really tried to practice what Chanel was saying, like the way to break that power is to funnel the resources into the community of the most marginalized. So I got money from the city of Toronto, and I just gave it away as much as I could. Paid people really well for being part of the project. The camera woman, the editor, everybody was two spirit. Everybody who was involved got lots of money just for coming out and talking and eating good food. So do that and watch the video feed. Do you your Smudge, don't judge. Assisting two spirit trans survivors of violence. It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube and it's on our It Starts With Us MMIW website. And also come out on February 14th, where we'll be for the 15th year trying to break the power of the Toronto police who are complicit in this violence. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, sorry. I didn't want to take any space or time away from trans people, but since it looks like nobody else wants to say anything, I'll go. Um, I'm a librarian, not at the CPL. Um, <laughs> I'm employed right now, so. Um, I wanted to just tell you guys and everyone here, who a lot of you were probably at the protest as well, um, you're not wrong for confronting the library. The library puts itself up as a very um, noble and open, welcoming space, but the library itself, and librarians have this conversation among each other, it is a very colonialist, white supremacist organization back to its very original history. Um, Melville Dewey was historic, huge sexist and racist, promoting eugenics, all of it. Um, and as was discussed earlier, um, even the, among the queer women of color, mar multiply marginalized people in libraries, these conversations are happening, but it's not happening at the level of those in power. Um, and I personally have felt pushed out by libraries. So I really feel for the trans community feeling unsafe in libraries right now. And I just want to say that, um, yeah, you should, we should all try and continue to fight to make libraries better and actually live up to the ideals that they try and promote. Thank you so much for that reflection. So important, thank you. Are there other comments or questions? Uh, hi, uh, outside of uh, donating and bullying people on Twitter, is there direct action that you would recommend people take uh, in the coming month? Great question. So the question is, is there a direct action we can take uh, beyond donating and bullying people on Twitter? Gwen? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna get myself canceled, but uh, date, date, sorry, I'm like, I do it a lot. Um, date trans people, pleasure trans people, form intimate relationships with trans people, particularly trans women and trans feminine folks. Um, people forget that who we date, who we love, who we partner is who we give our resources, our care, our focus, our attention to. And particularly for trans women and trans feminine folk, there's a lot of politics and violence around desirability and marginalizations on our bodies. And so I always tell people, and people don't like this answer because I think it's uncomfortable, um, but the biggest thing you can do, one of the biggest things you can do is be a partner in someone's life. Show up, love them, care for them. Yes, give them pleasure. That's a material thing that I think actually contributes to trans people's survival. Also, we're like hot. <laughs> I mean, Well, I think you could, like, something I tell a lot of people, because, you know, I think for safety, for some people it's around safety, it's about, you know, a lot of people work behind the scenes, too. You know what I mean? You can do advocacy by just, you know, sharing things, or, you know what I mean, just breaking down stereotypes, or, you know, or even doing, saying hi to someone that maybe a sex worker and trans on your street. You know what I mean? So there's so many little things that we, you know, just walking down the street and, and saying hi to someone that you might think might be trans or, you know what I mean? I think that just changes someone's day. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's a form of advocacy. Uh, speaking out against uh, your peers when they say, look at that person. You know what I mean? I think we, we as people have to change those ideas. I'm doing it all the time. I have, I, you know, I'm not the most beautiful and the most passable, but I know where I work, I work with a lot of more marginalized trans women than me that don't have a lot of the privilege that I have. I'm, I have privilege in spaces like this, you know what I mean, and in the work that I do. So, but I'm consistently, you know, uh, working with people, my colleagues, breaking down those stereotypes, oh, is that really a trans person? or or you know I'm, you know I'm there for my trans brothers and sisters that come to my programs, and making sure people ain't targeting them. So I think it's just being mindful, you know what I mean? Just uh, doing it your way and how that, you know what I mean? And being supportive. I think you know people do things in different ways and do it in the in the most comfortable ways. And sometimes 
you know, getting out of that comfortability too is a good thing. You know what I mean? And that's how I got to where I was. I had to get out of that comfort zone and speak out. And yeah, people go, oh, there comes that big sex worker and that big mouth and that media horror and all these other things. You know what I mean? But it's around visibility. And you know, I could say I was the poster trans girl for a lot of these ages, like Jesse's for Teens, Fred Victor, uh, Fife House, at places where I went to thinking that I was a client. People don't expect trans women of color, especially trans people, to hold jobs, especially jobs like in community services or, you know what I mean? So when people say, oh, she actually works here, you know what I mean? It changes people's minds. It takes that narrative that we're just these people, these freaks, these things we see on porn sites, and there's nothing wrong with being, I did porn, but you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it takes a lot of that stigma away to say that we're just as better and capable as anyone else in our society, and we have a lot of knowledge, and we have a lot to offer, so like I said, if you're that person hiring someone on a, in your workplace, or in your school, or whatever, make sure that you're giving that person a chance. You know, not and breaking down the, well, I don't know about that trans people. Because that is something I experienced when I did a lot of job interviews. I don't get them all. Because they're not ready for a trans person to work as, as a support worker or, or a case manager. But I know when I leave, I'm changing those ideas for the next person that comes there when they start feeling a little more comfortable. You know what I mean? So it's up to you to break down those things. Normalize trans people. We have to learn to normalize trans people that we are people. You know what I mean? And things will change. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a trans woman. Whoa, could you hold the mic a little bit closer to your mouth? Yeah, please? sure. Thank you. For a lot of us, the issue is housing. We need housing now. Not tomorrow, now. So, share with us your ideas, your homes with us. We are real people. We need, we need housing now, not tomorrow, this instant. So if you have ideas, let us know how to get housing because our lives are in danger now. Because when we, when we go to apply for housing, we don't know who we come across. It could be violence, we could die. I know that for the last three years, every time I go to get housing, I get rejected, and I dress like this. We are rejected for who we are. We can afford it, and many of us cannot afford it. So I'm asking the audience, give us ideas of how to acquire housing. Share with us your homes. We are real people. I am a caregiver. and. Even with caregiving, I still have to pay rent. And I caregive 24 seven. I've been a caregiver for 16 years as a live-in caregiver. And now I'm in precarious housing right at the moment and have been for the last four months. And I don't know when I will find housing again because the person, I'm, the place that I'm living now at the end of the month, they're returning back from Brazil, and I just rented their place for two months. Housing for us is precarious. You need to understand that. We don't have the same privileges as white folk do. We don't have the same privileges as neoliberals do. We don't have the same privileges as rich white people do yet we contribute to society, we pay taxes. So I'm letting you know now that we need housing. 
tell all the governments we need housing for trans people. Thank you. Thank you so much. So if you want to support trans folks with housing, I really, yeah, recommend that you share ideas. And also if you're renting rooms or you're looking for roommates, prioritize trans folks, prioritize trans women and trans women of color. Thank you so much for that really important point. Other comments and questions? So I wanted to thank uh, Gwen for um, sharing all of that analysis around the freedom of uh, information request for the library. And I'm just wondering like, about thoughts about where that might go and next steps with the library and all of that. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so uh, there is another FOI request that's been done um, that includes other terms. So we'll see what comes out of that. When you're doing FOI requests, you know, you sort of, it's the terms that they search for and you have to be really specific. So I don't think we're done yet going through Vickery Bull's email. Um, and we'll see what else we find. I really personally, and I think, you know, it, it depends on people's economic situations and, and what they need to do. I'm continuing a boycott of the library, the Toronto Public Library. Um, as complicated as that is for me, I'm still boycotting the library. I think we continue to talk about what happened. Um, I think we continue to ask questions of the Toronto Public Library Board, of Vickery Bulls, of the individual members, that we hold Councillor Gordon Perks and Councillor Paul Ansley um, to task for allowing this to occur, that we keep putting pressure on the City of Toronto and the Mayor John Tory to actually deal with these issues, right? They're a city agency. The City of Toronto has legal responsibility for them and needs to step in and make sure that the city librarian is doing her job, her mandated job. So we continue those um, actions and, and that activity. I know that there is also the possibility of legal action being taken against the City of Toronto, specifically a complaint to the Human Rights Tribunal for violating our, to protect our Section 15 rights as trans people that was violated by allowing Megan Murphy to come into the Toronto City Library and say that trans women are men. I mean, that's what she said. That violated our, our charter protected rights. So I know that that, that is another avenue that will um, go forward. I think really what needs to happen, so those are all the, the different pieces. I think you know what really needs to happen is people have to, as a coordinated group, continue to hold the Toronto Public Library accountable. You know, They said in their emails that they thought this issue would blow over, that it would go away, and that they could you know, sort of weather the storm and then it would fade into the distance. So we need to keep making noise. We keep need to showing up and saying, hey, do you remember when you did this? Can we talk about how that made us feel? Can we, can we work with you on finding a solution here so this doesn't happen again? Um, I think that's everything from me. Other folks? Yeah, I, I super agree with that, Gwen. I think um, something, something, that, like, uh, something that I've noticed and that may be confusing to the public and also to the literary community is that um, there's a history of these events actually blowing over, right? So this isn't the first public library that Megan Murphy or like a trans uh, exclusionary radical radical feminist has booked. Um, and, and in the past, there has been that kind of blowover effect. And I think we're starting to see that now um, in the literary community where a lot of folks um, who are authors, writers, vendors, that sort of thing, make comments about how they were, wanted to support trans community and they were outraged by, uh, by the Toronto Public Library's actions, but then you know, a couple months later went back to business as usual, right? Like went back to doing events or uh, partnering with the library um, uh, on, on various uh, collaborations. And so, yeah, I, th I think it's really important to, to keep the conversation going like we're doing now, uh, to keep on disrupting business as usual and what that can look like for a library patron. Um, so you don't necessarily have to stop using a library if it's something you rely on. It's something that you can keep on going up to um, workers in your library branch and bringing up. You can call the uh, Vancouver Public Library or send emails. That, that's, uh, that information is all um, available in the, public, uh, in the public sphere, who to contact. So to keep that conversation going and let um, the library board and Vickery Bowles know that you're not forgetting about this issue, I think is super important and not that hard an action to take either. Um, just so everyone knows, another story, Bookshop has 
Um, we're not selling at any of the events that we usually get asked to sell at uh, big events at the Appel Salon or A-List. So we are continuing not to sell. That started happening when the Megan Murphy event was booked. And we're also not booking any Toronto Public Library spaces for our own book launches. We do rent, we have rented Kai Chen Kong's book launch was at the Blow and Gladstone branch. So we're not renting them as a third party space as well for events, which is very hard because there are very few accessible, affordable spaces for book launches, but we are not doing that. And I believe Glad Day is not doing that as well. So we are the two bookstores that I know of that are refusing to sell at their events or to book their spaces for them. Are there any more comments about the public library in action before? Well, I just want to say, as someone that works in community service, that I know a lot of underhouse trans women and people and marginalized people. The library is a, is a safe place for them. It's a place where they feel safe, a place to get out of the cold, a place to connect with family over internet. You know what I mean? So to have a place where staff are promoting these kind of rhetoric kind of platforms it's really upsetting. And what does that say for people that are accessing those spaces, that need that space? And those are our spaces, not their spaces. So we need to keep this going and making sure they need to do something for the community that they allow to be bashed and to say, you know. So I'm asking all of you to keep those threads going on Twitter. <laughs> or we're on Facebook or through sites, you know what I mean? Because that library should be a safe space for all of us. And we should be able to be able to go in there, be respected with, with who we are and the self-identity identity of who we are. So thank you. Hi. Hi. Is it working? Um, I noticed that the Toronto Public Library Board is, a, the current citizen members, their terms will be up in mid-November 2022. Um, if a, you can apply to serve on Toronto City um, Boards online. That's a great if, idea. It, it, would it be possible maybe to organize a kind of like apply workshop where we where we all put our names in? <laughs> so I think that's a great idea. Maybe what we can do um, is like put that idea into our Facebook event and keep that conversation going online so it doesn't get lost in time to, to do those applications and Take over the library board. <laughs> Are there other comments about, uh, or questions about the TPL? Is, that, is there one here in the front? Or side and then front? Thank you for organizing. Um, as an educator, and someone who was at the Palmerston protest and the parent of a young trans person. Sir, you might need to put the mic even closer to, to your face. Sorry, I'm an educator and um, parent of a young trans person. And I was at the Palmerston protest. I'm choosing not to stop going to the library. Well, I guess I am. I'm not going in. But what I'm doing instead is I'm signing out on the online library app every single book that I can and I'm reading constantly so that I grow my knowledge and that I can then grow other allies. So I'm signing out books by trans authors um, and reading extensively and then sharing those titles with other parents of trans youth and other educators that need to change their mindset. Um, so it's just a different strategy. I'm not saying which is right, but it's just another one. Thank you. And just wondering if anyone on the panel or in the room have other suggestions for educators other than us uh, printed off the 519 Ally poster and it's in our staff room and it's in our office and I've emailed it to teachers. Um, I have a child in my class who is trans. 
uh, in middle school. So I'm being a fierce advocate, and I'm trying to get adults to stop saying boys and girls uh, in the classrooms, which is ridiculous. It's happening now. And Mother's Day, Father's Day, which we're still struggling with primary teachers doing. Uh, but I'm just wondering, other than attending events and asking my kid, um, and going to Glad Day and buying books as much as possible, can you give any other recommendations? Thank you. Thank you so much. I think there was a question there about um, suggestions for educators. I don't know if anyone on the panel has. Oh, yeah, but I don't have thoughts, right? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I think um, like it sounds um, like it sounds like the person who asked the question, I can't see you now. Uh, I was already, you're already doing a lot. And I think probably folks who are educators in this room are already thinking about these things. Um, I think that one thing I'll say about folks who are educators or working in the public uh, or social service realm, um, especially with youth, is that we have to be brave, right? It can be a scary thing to uh, stand up for trans people, to stand up, to stand up for trans young people, because uh, working in that sphere, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to get backlash um, and we can uh, sometimes have our professional lives threatened. And so what I would say is to not work in isolation but try to connect with other people who are doing similar or the same work because we're a lot more powerful when we're together and we're less in danger when we do that work together as well. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second is uh, to keep it up and keep going, right? We need as many folks doing advocacy, particularly if you happen to be um, a cis person because what, uh, what happens when there aren't cis people standing up and doing that kind of allyship and advocacy work is it falls to trans folks. Um, and it, it's... As, as dangerous as it is for cis people, it's a hundred times more dangerous for trans people to be in the public sphere and doing advocacy for ourselves, even though we have to do that every day. Further comments or questions? I think there was one here in the front. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, is that working? Uh, I'm not really sure if this is the right way to do this, but my name is Julia Duchesne and I'm a journalism student at Ryerson. Um, and I've been uh, trying to get some more media coverage on this story, and I'm, I'm going to be writing like a long feature about the public library decision-making process and the uh, impact of it on the trans community in Toronto this semester. So I'm going to put my contact information on the Facebook event, but also if you feel like you'd be interested in talking to me about that um, as a source, just come and find me after the event. Um, one thing that we as individuals can do, both the fellow high friends, high people, and sorry, could you hold the mic a little is closer? Is to go on the website and see um, where the city of Toronto, um, the QTC, daycares, schools, colleges, universities, get on the board to make some representation and see where you can fit because you can like it. So, so if I'm hearing correctly, the suggestion is to get on boards uh, to make some representation and um, get trans and queer leadership in decision-making power. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to check on you. Is that mic on? It is on, but I think the sound system, um, if anyone would like to donate to make a stronger sound system, <laughs> I'm sure they would love speakers everywhere speaking as an event organizer. I think it's just... It's a function of the mic, but it is on. I Real. Think is, okay. I know the sound volume is up to max. That's what I've been told. Fair so enough. Have whoever's <laughs> speaking into it, speak loud. And I have a very loud voice. I can also repeat the question. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much. My name is Ewan, and my mom is manager for West End Branches, the library. And I think that do a better job with this. Um, I'd be, um, Ooh. I'm gonna have to work we just there. got that over here. I could um, provide for like contact email address <laughs> to, to the panelists, and I would advocate that you send her an email. 
spicy. Well, yes, please do uh, feel free to share, and best of luck talking this over at family dinner if there is going to do that. <laughs> Sometimes we have to make personal sacrifices to be allies. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to speak quickly to the, to the comment made earlier about housing and the desperate need for housing, because that's such a huge, such a, such a, such a key component, because we all live in Toronto, we all know that housing is unbearable, uh, and so you just need to imagine how much worse it is if there's sort of compounding, um, marginalizing factors. Um, something I wanted to throw out, because often people talk about housing and say, like, yeah, we need like a 10-year plan or whatever, but the person who spoke at the back spoke very bravely about how we need a plan now and immediately. I want to draw the attention to, or draw folks' attention to the work uh, of a group called Moms for Housing in yeah. Oakland. Yeah. You know Moms yeah. for Housing? Yeah. yeah. They are cool. Um, a group of um, uh, um, uh, homeless black women occupied an empty building, an empty house that was being used as a financialized uh, tool, uh, uh, like being just held as a bank by a bank by an investment company looking to make money off of it. Uh, and they occupied it, uh, and they started living there. Uh, they were forced out by military militarized police. Um, but the sort of ensuing, because they went there, because they were dragged out, because they made this because they organized around this, those mothers have been, uh, made, the, the, the company has offered to sell those mothers that house, um, and they are sort of moving forward to live in that place. And so what I'm wondering is who has empty houses, I know it's Toronto and the rental market's crazy, but like who has houses on their streets that people haven't lived in for six months, and who is willing to do something a little bit illegal to solve a problem? <laughs> So it sounds like what you're proposing is a militant takeover of empty houses by trans people who then call the bluff on the idea that there isn't enough housing and that in fact there are more empty houses than homeless people in most cities and that is true for Toronto too. Am I, did I hear you right? I just wanted to make sure I summarized that. Okay, great, thank you. Three big empty houses. What's the address on Spadina? What's the addresses of the houses? Or the intersection? Post it on yeah, the We can get that event. in the Facebook event also, the addresses of those three empty houses. Just to know, yeah. then um, let's see what can happen. Oh, trans people are wonderful. We're like, oh, we're so nice. We're just having dialogue. Also, we're going to take over these houses now. <laughs> but also, yes. Give us your money and give us your houses. <laughs> nice trans people 2020. There's a comment here in the front. Hi. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to word this. I want to make sure that we're defending our trans brothers and sisters if you are a trans person, if you're a cis person. It, the government right now is very scary and we cannot allow anything to happen to, I have a certain amount of privilege and many of us do and I wanna make sure that all of my friends and my chosen family are protected. I wanna make sure that they don't come for my friends and, and chosen family and we're all either queer, have loved ones who are, are somewhere on the spectrum. We can't have them come for any of us. And it starts with trans folks. I don't, I don't know if this is a bad way to put it, but it's like a canary in a coal mine in a way. They think that trans folks won't fight back. Well, they're fucking wrong. And we'll fight for them too. And not just because it might endanger us, but because we're a community and we support each other. And like I said, it's very scary right now, and a lot of shit came out in October that made me very scared as well. And I can't even imagine how anyone else is feeling either. So that's all I had to say. And thank you for all the work that you all have done for this evening and for the library and for everything. Else.
Oh, I think there was a comment up here on um, like a slide or yeah. Um, I can't see the second. Yeah, just here in the yeah. I just really want to I thank you for organizing this and thank you too for the grace and openness that you always bring to the conversation. Um, I also want to acknowledge that gay cis men, particularly white men, uh, have been responsible and continue to be responsible for excluding and devaluing the lives of trans folks and sex workers, particularly those of color, and that we as gay cis men need to take responsibility and accountability for our actions, not only individually, but as a community. And gay cis men occupy so many positions of power, we need to start stepping back from those and supporting our trans friends and trans folks of color to be in those positions. Uh, folks have a complicated relationship with Pride Toronto, but folks are probably aware that the executive director has stepped down. That position is open. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, there's like, maybe, maybe if someone has access to like a job application, if it's up yet, to put that on online, promote the trans friends. If you happen to be on the hiring committee, um, I will also say that the job of executive director of Pride sounds like not necessarily the funnest. Um, <laughs> just saying. So if there is a trans person who comes to be in that role, let's maybe think about how they can be supported in doing it and not cannibalized. Um, so yes, comment in the back. Hello? Okay. Hello? We're gonna be close, it's real close. Um, I would just like to say, um, I think it is good to know that the, how close? The Creative Prime L? Perfect. Oh, sorry. I would just like to say that there are uh, cis hetero allies who are out there who are trying their best to understand and we should continue to keep that all branch out for them, even if they don't fully get it. Because during the whole public library debacle, they're only getting part of the story because they not, they're not part of our social media, really. And they're going to read news, as Peter Stanis said, one way or right down the middle. So it's important for us to let them know this is what's actually happening and this is why it's important. And I found even sharing articles or tweets that better show what's give them a better understanding can really help as my brother and sister-in-law took their nephew out of the Toronto Public Library because of what was happening and because I shared the um, Glad Day article about it and a number of other people also read it and had the same sentiments and did it and said thank you because they didn't fully understand what's going on. So, so I want to say thanks. Thank you so much. Educate your sis and straight friends and family. Um, just to let folks know as well, I don't think we mentioned this, there's water, coffee, tea, fruit, and some cookies. Thank you to the folks at Tabernacle and 519 for providing that. So if anyone needs to get up and stretch and get something to eat or drink, now that you've given us your houses and your money, you can get the refreshments. Um, I'm hearing from the panelists that it might be time to wrap up, actually. It's just incredibly hot up here, and it's also nine. So I, maybe we can wrap up after this comment? Yeah? Perfect. Is this, is this close enough? Okay, it's good. Um, so hi, I'm Felix, a non-binary trans person, and I actually run an employment program one day a week at the uh, aforementioned uh, organizations. Um, but one thing I have been noticing in my program uh, I have some people in my program that have bachelor's degrees and can't find employment. I also work part-time as a consultant outside of this job, and I will tell the allies, if you want to really go hard with your allyship and actually be accomplices to the trans community, look ar like, for those of you who are employed, look around your, your jobs. How accessible are they for trans people? Like honestly, the men's room, do they have menstrual products available and are there rubbish bins? Really easy test, I can guarantee that they won't. Um, intake forms, is there gender field, like, does it look like man, woman, or trans? Like, trans is not its own category, let's, let's be real. How comfortable would a trans person be to accessing your center of employment? You, I advise all of you to really 
advocate to your manager, your manager's manager, be that annoying squeaky wheel for us, like go hard for us please. Um, because the thing is, if a, tr if a place of employment is not welcoming up trans people, we won't get those jobs, and if we don't have money, we won't get housing. We need to like a wraparound model of care for this. So I think it might be time to wrap up, but I want to say the teaching is a, I, I want to thank folks who shared their amazing ideas and comments and questions. So if you have an idea for organizing or if you have a home that you would like to rent or better yet, give away um, to, I'm, I'm kind of serious actually, um, I'm really serious. Uh, if you have space or money or time or you have an organizing idea, if you want to organize fellow, uh, if you are cis and you want to organize fellow cis allies and accomplices around a particular task, like, um, like getting rich gay men to donate money to trans people, for example, that is actually a super worthy cause. Um, or if you are, like, if you are um, a manager or an executive director um, in the nonprofit network and you want to get uh, working on hiring trans people at the managerial and executive director level, I suggest maybe organizing now, right? Like, uh, maybe putting up your hands and identifying yourself as someone who would like to work on a project together in this room. So you can start getting contact information and having those conversations today. Because I think as we've heard, we need these things to start happening today. Not, not tomorrow, not a five year plan, not a 15 year plan. We need trans advocacy and trans safety in public spaces. We need to hold the library accountable today. So um, maybe if you do have an organizing idea, raise your, like stand up and identify yourself and just say quickly what it is and maybe Andrew can bring you a mic for that. So let's stand and say it. Let's stand and identify yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Michelle. Um, I actually have two ideas. Um, one, I think it might be useful if some of us got together and maybe wrote letters to the library once a month and just committed a day, right? Uh, write a letter to them once a month. And then the second one, is I know in the States they've got the run for something campaign which is trying to get women of color to run for whatever dog catcher um, maybe we need to organize something for that surrounding trans folks trans folks of color so if anyone's got any ideas about that drive to Toronto oh there you go yeah, yeah. Exactly. so if you want to talk about writing a letter monthly or weekly to the TPL please talk to Michelle right Michelle, Michelle here at the front or if you want to get together and talk about Encouraging folks to run for positions. Yes, there's a. Uh, I just wanted to give a piece of advice to anyone who's thinking about organizing. So actually, we're we're only going to do organizing ideas that you want to okay. talk about with other folks right now, because because we we want to respect our panel of time. Uh, well, then I have two. <laughs> awesome. Please share. Uh, as. Uh, has been screamed at me many times by a dear friend of mine, start small, but start now. Uh, and I uh, like both of the ideas that were brought up, and I think that also going on to the Toronto Public Library website, you can see all of the people who are in charge, all of their staff and all of their emails. If people just want to write a few stock emails, and send around the format to anyone who's willing to email them from a valid address, that's something that you can organize fairly quickly and within a small community and still have a large impact. Awesome, thanks so much. You can all take pictures of this uh, email. You can take pictures and tweet it, put it on Instagram, Facebook, and remember to do the Password Toronto, do a little short explanation of where the money's being raised for. Well, we can do that now. Awesome. So if anyone has any last burning organizing acti uh, activities they'd like to get together for, Catherine? Uh, just for um, the people in the room that are uh, cis allies, I think a lot of times um, we uh, breed or dissociate when someone starts to um, get in our face uh, with transphobic rhetoric. And I think it's really um, important for all of us to train just as you would train at the gym 
um, for those of us who go to gym, like not me. Um, but um, if uh, like, but train like as if you're an athlete to be an ally. Um, read resources as to what to like, how to navigate those difficult conversations. Uh, Rania Al Mujamar holds an amazing workshop called "Shut It, Uncle Bob," which really teaches us how to embody allyship. Do it. Do the workshop. Read the resources and embody it. Have it in your body so that you're ready. Um, just as you would um, train for a marathon for those of us who run marathons. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a loud, yes? Okay. Um, the Toronto Public Library also has a bunch of organizations uh, called Friends. So Friends of the Osborne, Friends of the TPL, uh, they have a lot of money. Uh, they're totally run by volunteers, so I'm unsure of the way to use that to our best advantage, but there is a lot of resource there, and as they are TPL but not TPL, um, they can do things to get around the rules. I have, I'm currently on a leave of absence because I'm unsure how to engage with the friends right now, and this is why I'm here. Um, but I do know that if there could be some sort of takeover or some sort of uh, resource to use that, uh, it, it, it's mostly run right now by like cis, older, white, privileged women almost exclusively, um, so if there was a way to change that tie, I'm not sure how to go about it, but I'm just putting out there that there is this Do you want to, area. would you be willing to talk to people about it? Tonight? Yeah, I would. Do you want to share your name? Yeah, my name is Sarah Marie McMahon, and my email is Sarah Marie, well, S-E-R-A-H-M-A-R-I-E, -E, so Sarah Marie at gmail.com. So if you want to yeah. talk about a Friends of the Library takeover, come talk to Sarah here at the front. I think it might be time to wrap up because folks are starting to leave anyway. So let us uh, let us wrap up. And if you have more ideas and you want to organize, get online and get your folks together. Thanks so much for coming to this teaching. Thanks to our panel. Thanks to Anzi. Thanks to the 519. Everyone who has played a part in organizing this, let's get out of here and make some noise.